Hello, thanks everyone for joining us tonight for the second of the SWANA 2022 Film Festival. So this is a screening of uh, Southwest Asian and North African films uh, curated by Christine Hajar. Uh, my name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the curator of performance and moving image here at uh, Dunlop Art Gallery and RPL Film Theater. And uh, as a first generation settler, I'm currently living here on Treaty 4 territory, home of the Nehewak, the Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here uh, also for uh, yesterday's screening, uh, which both screenings uh, are available on VUCAVU, uh, VUCAVU.com, if you uh, haven't had the opportunity to see the films. Uh, we are going to have a conversation with Christina Ajar, as well as Zarka Narwaz, uh, who um, also, um, sorry, uh, just See Christine coming, and we're just going to uh, set up the stage here for conversation. And we welcome you to uh, contribute to the conversation. And if you're coming in online, uh, please include your questions uh, in the chat, and we'll uh, have those uh, answered by our guests here. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Christina and uh, Zarka to the stage. Turn the light. Well, welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me? So this is the second time I've viewed these films and I have to tell you, Christina, I do learn something new every time I watch them again. For you, I had asked you this yesterday, did you find, you're supposed to be, I don't know how many times you've seen these films, but do you find each time you watch them get something new? Yeah, um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Oh, it's not on. Hello. Okay. Hello? Hello? Hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint what um, exactly is new for me uh, upon watching these over and over, but yeah, I'm just amazed at the way that the filmmakers use uh, archival footage. And as someone who's like very interested in uh, the archive, which is like, what is the archive? How is it alive um, today? And like, how is it kept alive? I'm just, yeah, really um, amazed by how the different filmmakers do that in their own ways and how history is like kept alive in this way. So yeah, I enjoyed watching the films again today. Actually, shout out to Shimbi, who's in the audience, um, because uh, the last film, Better With a Chai Taste of Sweetness, I had watched for the first time at Windex Film Festival in Winnipeg uh, in Treaty One. And uh, I just really love that like opening scene with the dripping coffee and the oddness of watching these scenes like filmed on an angle. So yeah. So let's talk about the first film because that was in many ways more traditional in filmmaking in terms of a story that you could follow. And it was a very powerful film about an abusive incident that happened in a young woman's life. And I wanted to ask you about the, for the, I didn't actually notice before that it started off with the Azan and then what looked like a microscope of an image. And I thought that was such an interesting juxtaposition. I wanted you to just talk about that. If you, if you um, well, I'm not very, uh, I don't know like what that opening song was, but. What was the Azan? Yeah. Yeah, the call there. And then the microscopic. It is of her ear. Is it? Oh, I am okay. assuming that like that's, I don't know if it's of her ear or of just like what it would have looked like to examine her ear. Um, but I think that we see that conversation of like um, 
what role religion plays in the family throughout the film. And so, yeah, I think opening the scene with the song and then uh, bringing up the Quran like several times throughout the film to kind of uh, see the tension between them, like the father using it as um, a justification of his behavior. And then also um, trying to like impose lessons through the Quran and then her like obvious resistance to that. It was yeah. so fascinating because she she filmed these really touching, tender vignettes with her parents. Yeah. And then she had the conversation I know. <laughs> over that. And I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, I thought it was really creative the way that um, like in some scenes there are just um, these gestures between um, her and the parent like one on one and then the audio was used. And I think that um, the way that it was shot created opportunities for like different kinds of engagement because basically what she was doing was like instigating an experiment with her family. And I think um, it was really wise to have those scenes where it was just the audio um, because, you know, although they were like super, super uh, into the project and like, you know, willing to participate, it still is totally different to know that you're being filmed. And so maybe that uh, conversation where it was just the audio, like a lot for more, uh, authenticity or vulnerability and overlaying that with these images of like grooming one another like it's so intimate yeah and for the first time i noticed on the second viewing that she kind of explained the situation at the very beginning when you don't understand what's happening mm -hmm. and then when you finally get a sense of it and you know she asks each person to sit on in the chair and explain and then after that incident she explains what happened <coughs> with the incident, but you think she's talking about what happened with the, the three of them talking. And you get mixed up between the reality of what happened in the past and what she's actually doing right now. Did you notice that? Um, I'm not really sure what you're referring <laughs> <That's okay>. to. <laughs> it, I, I thought it was like you get confused as to whether she's talking about the incident in the past or, the, or, oh, or right. what's happening right now while she's filming. Yeah, yeah, there is a little bit of that blurring, um, even with um, the mom also talking about like um, this process, like her displeasure with like how the process is going of like the actual filmmaking and then like referring to like the incident that was years ago. But yeah, overall I felt like um, it was supposed to be kind of ambiguous. Uh, I think that the filmmaker like used Hala used cuts in a really interesting way so that there could be some like mystery preserved and also like to reflect like the emotional uh, landscape of like how it would have felt to be like inside of that situation too for her. I know. I mean, she made it so frustrating in the sense that you just wanted the father to say, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Get her to apologize for what she did to him. And it was right. so fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I think the fact that her parents participated in that process was very, very brave and cool. Um, and that it was like published, like it didn't go as planned. And yet, obviously there would have been like some consent given to just like go ahead with the film. Yeah, so I appreciate about it, it's very raw and it's very real. Um, and it feels like that in the moment too, like she says, in the film, like, I don't care about what's going on in the outside world. Like, when you're having those conflicts, like, they really are all you can feel and think about. And it's a long film to sit through. The first time I watched it um, at the Reframe Film Festival online, I felt like traumatized after. And it just goes on and on through this process but that's like such a small glimmer of like what they probably have been going through it's true yeah. this the second film had to do with when kuwait invaded iraq and 
Other way around. Wait, 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 the rock. <laughs> wait. And it was fascinating for me because that, that had happened in 1990. And I never considered what had happened to the Kuwaiti. Mm -hmm. I just figured the Americans moved in and everything had been fine. But the story was about a displaced family and having to leave the Sudan and what happened to them. And it, and it kind of brought home, especially with what's happening in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it just brought home this, the, whole, the whole issue of just the like, painful, traumatic, you know, what happens in war and displacement, immediate displacement. Yeah, and the displacement like over and over as well. Like when we think of like diaspora or, or displacement, we often think of like um, leaving like the Middle East to come to like the West. But actually, like there are so many layers of displacement and so many steps involved. Um, and then in the film, um, your father was born 100 years old, and so was the Nakba. Like. They mentioned the British ship, which is going to Beirut. And so, yeah, a lot of Palestinians are um, exiled in, and end up um, in Lebanon or in other areas of the Swana region. And so, yeah, just, uh, just because we see these films based on like, uh, one, like a singular story of diaspora, we can assume that uh, those aren't like the full, that's not the full picture necessarily of how many times a family has been displaced. And even within like the discourse of diaspora as well, it's often thought to be as um, moving from one country to another. Uh, but we can think of diaspora as like also being displaced like from your hometown to another place um, within the country that you live in. And so when we think about diaspora in that definition, we can also then um, think about, we can also then consider diaspora as an experience uh, faced by indigenous peoples in Canada as well. Um, but indigenous peoples aren't usually like included in the discourse of diaspora. But it's not just like from country to country, it's just this displacement from your home space. Exactly. Can you explain Sira to me? I found that one more difficult to understand. Was it about loss, the family loss? Um, well, Sira uh, means bio in Arabic. And the filmmaker Rola Tahir, uh, who's a Toronto-based artist, um, is someone that I recently connected with and, and whose work I admire. And I think just the fact that the title is named Bio is really interesting um, because like we have part one, part two, and then part three, which is Canada, and it says to be continued. So I think that maybe uh, if you know that Sarah means bio, we can just think about uh, even the ways in which as artists or as uh, filmmakers or as creatives, we're expected to self-identify or, um, you know, present our stories in palatable ways or know exactly how to um, self-identify. And I think that story is interesting because we're tracing her lineage and it leaves us in like a question mark of what, what happens in Canada so yeah, to explain it, I'm, I'm not sure what I would say beyond like, I think this is a story of a filmmaker who is tracing her archival footage and also prompts, um, prompts to, prompts her, I don't think it's mother, prompts her grandmother to tell uh, their story. And so that's why I placed them uh, one after another, the perfect picture in Sira, um, because they were both like, Filmmakers like instigating uh, these processes with their family members. And that's kind of like the idea of the whole program, experimental archives, which is how do artists, how do filmmakers contend with the past and rework archives into new archives so that uh, memory is kept alive and so that they're understood within a new context. That's really good. Can you explain the final film? <laughs> <laughs> explain it well I don't know like it's just kind of what you get from it I think um, 
immediately like opening to the dripping coffee, coffee scene. Yeah. I think of like futurisms and um, like when you drink coffee and you leave the grinds to dry out and someone reads your fortune. Uh, that's what I think of when I see like the ways that the patterns of the coffee are dripping down is really beautiful. And then like the disorientation of the image, um, which is like off kilter is kind of like um, what I interpret as like uh, reminiscent of the filmmakers experience in diaspora, looking back and kind of experiencing the oddness of his context, which is like the last line of the film uh, says, like how strange it is to survive. And yeah, these films are about survival, uh, but it's also about like how the West is not this, um, this like, you know, the fictiveness of the Canadian dream or the American dream and how, um, yeah, that feelings of like grief or searching or um, whatever, all those <laughs> feelings that come with diaspora like never end. And so there isn't like, this happy ending kind of like in Sierra, like it ends as like to be continued it's not like oh we've arrived in canada and now our life is awesome yeah. i wanted to open up the question to the audience as well because i can go on <laughs> you can tell is there anyone out there that has a question about the film i know that for people who've seen it for the first time there are a lot to go through and you may not remember the title but we can talk about first second third if that's easier is anyone out there would like to ask christina some questions as I stare at everyone. <laughs> Am I putting you guys on the spot? <laughs> no pressure. I just, the, the film where he was tying the, the socks together on the body. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that film? Clutch My Fists. Yeah, tell me about that film. That was such a fascinating film because it's about a death and a family. Yeah. Um, explain that to me. <laughs> Okay, so that film is, I actually don't have anything to explain about it because it's a collage work. And so um, if you're thinking that like these films as like experimental works are like kind of ambiguous and the narrative is very up for interpretation, I feel like that's even more so for Clench My Fists. Um, while, all the other, while all the films in the program tonight use like family archives, that film actually uses found footage. So Clench My Fists um, is created by a US-based uh, mixed Lebanese filmmaker who I recently met and uh, feel really happy to have connected with. Um, she and I talked about our interest in glitch art. And so in that film, like she's using uh, found footage to speak to her the, her, her experience of grief within Arab families. And so um, I don't know if anyone watches the show The 100, but like she also, it's like a sci-fi or like a dystopian uh, TV show. And there's some uh, footage from that show and a bunch of other places as well. And so, yeah, like collaging is all about just like stringing together this um, seemingly unrelated, uh, these seemingly unrelated snippets to create a sort of like emotional arc. And I think that uh, we're not really supposed to know like what's going on. We don't know like who died or like what's happening with the family. We just get this like strong sense of not being okay. And like this, the, the young girl who's um, who was just going through it and from her perspective and some more like uh, hints of like also like family violence as well in that one. It's so interesting because there are tropes about Muslims and Arab violence, yet when I watch it, I don't feel any of the reinforce those tropes, that there's more about family universality and the feelings that all families have regardless of the background. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just real. Like, I don't, like, the films that I'm interested in are only, like, uh, Swana filmmakers making films about, like, being Swana. And so, however they want to represent their own stories, um, I mean, you know, people can, like, 
just because people are making identity-based art doesn't mean it's not necessarily going to perpetuate like harmful uh, depictions of that identity. But what I mean to say is like I trust the filmmakers like abilities to represent their own stories. And yeah, I agree. I don't think that they're um, perpetuating harmful like stereotypes or whatever. But then again, like that's also about gaze. Like if you are like looking for that, then. <laughs> your trash <laughs> you know it's just like what what gaze like what are you trying to get out of this you know and I think that's also um that's also part of what I'm doing like as a curator is like putting these films together and trying to create like an impression and an affective response uh, by putting them in a row <laughs> And for those who don't know, because this was new to me, the term swana, can you explain where that comes from? Uh, so swana describes the region of Southwest Asia and North Africa, and Southwest Asia is the region known as the Middle East. And so it's just a, um, a term that is considered to be less Eurocentric and a more decolonial description of the Middle East. And uh, yeah, a lot of people still like don't recognize it, like Swana themselves, and particularly like older Swana. Of course, like there's so much like uh, problematization of uh, this acronym, and also like what are what are the countries considered in this region? And so I'm using the term to kind of loosely uh, present films from this region, but I'm also very very interested and energized by conversations that problematize um, how we name things and what is considered to be included because uh, clearly like I'm interested in a more decolonial approach and if we consider like how nations, how, how countries and borders are fake, then how can we determine like where the region starts and ends? Like there are you can type into Google and say like countries of Swana and you'll get like lists of the countries, but those lists are contested and they should be. Yeah. So I wanted to give a plug to your work because you are going to be showing the work yeah. the neutral ground. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> the exhibition, uh, my exhibition, Don't Forget to Count Your Blessings is opening this evening at Neutral Ground. And it is a, an installation inspired by hookah lounges. And it is kind of tracing my own experience of love in East diaspora and grief and leisure and pleasure and all those things together. So it is, uh, it is supposed to be an exhibition that people can rest in and hang out in. There are crutches and there's going to be food and yeah, it's, it's up until May 21st, so it opens tonight at 7 if you can be there, and if not, then you can visit the gallery. Excellent. And you have some of your artwork for sale here today? Yeah. I have uh, my zine called Diaspora Daughter, Diaspora Dyke, and postcards as well. And you have your book. I have my book, Jamila Green Ruins Everything, and Annabelle is here selling, I think, yeah, she's here. There she is. <laughs> She's the owner of our very own independent bookstore, Penny University Bookstore. And I think this would be a good time for us to maybe talk to each other about what we've seen and if anyone wants to purchase, it would be great. So I want to thank everyone for coming. This was a great screening. Thank you. And we'll see you tonight at the yes. Ground. Thank you so much for this. Really Thank you. And I'm really excited that the, all the filmmakers um, have agreed to uh, have their films available online as well. So that is a huge plus. And they're not geotagged, so they're available globally. And they're going to be up until the end of the month on Bookaboo. And just thank you again to RPL Film Theater and to Thomas for uh, this invitation and uh, hosting this space. And Zarka for the Q&A yesterday and today, and uh, the other uh, staff who uh, are making this work. <laughs> so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone.